Administration Program. And I'm extremely pleased today to be here with Elizabeth May, leader of the Green Party of Canada, as well as the first elected member of Parliament from the Green Party representing the Saanich Islands in South Vancouver Island. We have had the, the chance to speak for a few minutes prior to coming to this room, and I can tell you she is amazingly knowledgeable about public policy and public administration, and has many connections to Johnson Shoyama, who our school is named after, who, which she might tell you about when we get to the discussion section. Um, she's stopped here in, in, in Saskatchewan. We're very privileged and fortunate to have her on a whistle-stop tour of Canada, literally a whistle-stop tour because she's taking a train and bus across Canada, speaking on a number of issues, including climate change. She will speak for about 20 minutes today and then take questions and answer, or take questions from students both here in Regina and Saskatoon, and I'll moderate that. Before she starts, I'd like to tell you a little bit more about her achievements and accomplishments. In <laughs> I'm, I'm really old now, so the list of so-called achievements and accomplishments has gotten embarrassingly long. <laughs> One of the primary ones is she was named uh, an officer of the Order of Canada in 2005, and that's because of decades-long leadership in, in the environmental movement. And that started when she was a, a young woman in growing up in Nova Scotia and, and got involved in efforts to prevent spraying of Agent Orange in the forest there. She then went to law school at Dalhousie and and graduated and worked in public interest advocacy for several years in Ottawa, including on the indigenous file. And then later moved into government as a special policy advisor to the Minister of Environment, where she had a role in establishing several of the national parks here in Canada. After which she became the head of the Sierra Club of Canada and served in that role for 17 years before becoming the head of the Green Party and being elected to Parliament. She's also a mother and grandmother, and a particular interest to us here at the school, a scholar. She has taught at Queen's University and Dalhousie, and has written eight books. And the most recent is, Who Are We? Who We Are, Reflections on My Life and on Canada. So without further ado, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you, Cheryl. Thanks to the students in Saskatoon. Thanks to students here in Regina. I want to acknowledge we're on the traditional territory of Treaty 4, uh, First Nations, and uh, acknowledge with gratitude the generosity of Meg Rich. Uh, so yes, Saskatchewan, I would just digress enough to say Saskatchewan's played a big life in that, big role in the trajectory of my life that Cheryl just shared with you, in that the position with, and the, the enormous good luck, my life could be described as a whole bunch of serendipity, but in any case, one piece of enormous good luck was when the Federal Minister of Environment in 1986 persuaded me to leave the practice of law to be uh, a, a policy advisor, his senior policy advisor in Ottawa. So that's when I really learned how government works when it works well. And it did work well in that era when it was a majority progressive conservative government under Brian Mulroney. And uh, after two years of being there, I actually resigned uh, at, on a matter of principle because um, my boss broke the law in approving permits for dams in Saskatchewan. So the Rafferty Alameda dam issue was when I was quite suddenly jettisoned. I mean, I made my own decision and I made it, you know. If this kind of thing can happen while I'm senior policy advisor and it's done behind my back, then clearly I don't really have a job anymore. But it was a trade-off to satisfy Grant Devine they cut corners to give permits for Rafferty and Alameda dams. They said, okay, you'll be happy because you'll get Grasslands National Park. And in the bargain, Saskatchewan will translate its statutes into French, which will show that, that Quebec, that Brian Mulroney can accomplish bilingualism. Never mind how bad that was, but that's when I left government. But during those two years that I worked in government was when I got to know one of my dearest friends and most significant mentors of my life, whose name was Jim McNeil. And it's through Jim McNeil that Al Johnson and Tommy Shyama uh, and I would spend time sitting at Jim's uh, condo, Jim and Phyllis McNeil. Uh, they all worked in T.C. Douglas's government. They all went, that the Saskatchewan Mafia arrived in Ottawa and made a real difference. But it's through my friend Jim McNeil, who by the way was uh, also from Saskatchewan, graduate of the University of Saskatchewan, 
uh, and uh, who became, through many places in the federal civil service of the government of Canada, including advising Pierre Trudeau on the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. Uh, there was a moment when they almost put the right to a healthy environment, the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, and the only way I know that is that Jim McNeil told me. But through Jim McNeil, when I came here to this institution, I thought, Johnson, Cheyenne, could it be? Tommy, Shana, and oh, and Al Johnson? I know them, I knew them, particularly Al, really well. We spent a lot of time visiting because they were two of Jim's best friends. And Jim passed away uh, far too soon uh, in uh, spring of 2017. So, miss him every day. But that's my connection to the Institute and the, the very fine tradition, the intellectual tradition, the deeply principled moral and ethical tradition of Al Johnson and Tommy Shyama. And I am honored to stand in a place that bears their name. Now, I, I initially said that what I wanted to talk about today, because it's what I always want to talk about, is the climate crisis. And I've been giving lectures under the title 1.5 to stay alive. So I want to tell you about where that comes from and why it's true, and then open up the floor to any questions and conversation, either from students in Saskatoon or here in Regina. I've been working on the climate issue since 1986 when I went to work for the Ministry of Environment. I had come out of, as you heard from the introduction, a lot of work on pesticides as a volunteer. I've done a lot of work on energy policy, particularly against nuclear power. My earliest friends in Saskatchewan were all in the Interchurch Uranium Committee. And so that's my, that's my, my sort of uh, environmental movement volunteer work. Before I went to the Office of the Ministry of Environment, I'd worked on acid rain, but when I got to Environment Canada, the Environment Canada scientists were already working on the issue of uh, global warming, climate change. And I learned the science from Environment Canada scientists before the myth of doubt was invented. And if Jim was here, if Jim McNeil was here, he would tell you that at the Rio Earth Summit in 1992, where the Secretary General was another Canadian of prairie origins, Morris Strong, but 1992 in the Earth Summit, Jim always said, was when the Carbon Club was formed. It's when the large fossil fuel industries, big oil, realized that governments around the world were actually serious about climate change. We signed and ratified a convention in that year. Every single government on Earth stood on a stage and said we're serious about the threat of global warming. And the range was from George Bush to Fidel Castro. Everybody. It's the largest gathering of heads of government in the history of the planet at that time. But what Jim noted was that's when the Carbon Club formed because big oil realized, oh, this could affect our profits, what do we do? And they began a campaign of deliberate misinformation that was global, but particularly targeted on North America. So we began to have people say, well, we don't really know if it's true, there's two sides to the story. And, and shamefully, uh, media that should have known better carried it as if there was some debate about whether burning fossil fuels was going to endanger our future. And one of the early challenges of this issue, and it was the, inter the Framework Convention on Climate Change, which is the document to which I refer, still every country on Earth is legally bound to its terms, said that we have to reduce greenhouse gases sufficiently quickly so that we, we stabilize in a new level of atmospheric carbon dioxide concentrations that would avoid levels that could become dangerous. So the word in the convention is dangerous. It isn't reflected in the 1992 treaty in terms of parts per million CO2, when sometimes we campaigned around parts per million CO2, sometimes we campaigned around percentage reductions. But we began to, what's dangerous? So the IPCC, which was formed in 1988, with great leadership from Canada, by the way, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change was formed so that governments could get policy advice based on science that is inherently complex and incredibly interdisciplinary. You've got roles in climate science for mathematicians, physicists, biologists, um, ecologists, marine biologists. There's just, there, it's hardly a discipline you can think of that isn't touched as you figure out climate science. And the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change involves uh, the leading scientists in every country, but they're appointed by their governments. And every report of the IPCC has to go through the, you know, the most phenomenally um, time-consuming, one might say time-wasting, 
governmental review process. It's the ultimate peer review process because they look at every document published in the science and they review it and they decide which levels of science have what level of confidence. So they'll report where there's 90% confidence versus some it might be 50% confidence. But at the 90 to 95 degree level of confidence is when they say, yeah, this is what's happening. We know it. That's why. So in the IPCC, they were initially asked, what looks dangerous? They struggled with this. They said, well, certainly, if we, if we double carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere, that's very dangerous. And at no time in the last million years have CO2 concentrations exceeded 280 parts per million. We used to only talk about parts per million, not 1.5. Well, we're now at over 400 parts per million. We're the first human beings in the history of our species to breathe air with 400 parts per million CO2. But then they said, okay, well then they started changing the focus. Well, what is the impact at 400 parts per million? If we hold it to below 425 parts per million, can humanity survive? Will the biosphere still be hospitable for us and other species that we'd like to keep around? Then they shifted from talking about parts per million and a, a particular workshop in the UK said, we, we know one thing, we have to ensure we stay below 425 parts per million because that will inevitably take us to two degrees Celsius and two degrees Celsius is maybe safe, but we won't go extinct. That's what we mean by safe now. We don't mean we won't have extreme weather events. There is no safe that means no extreme weather events. There is no safe that doesn't mean droughts. There is no safe available to us now that doesn't mean hundreds of thousands of environmental refugees. What we're doing is trying to hold on to a world in which we can uh, survive as a species with other species. So two degrees became a thing. And when we went to Copenhagen in 2009, which was COP15, which was supposed to be the uh, the global negotiation. By the way, when I say COP, uh, back to public policy and buzzwords of the UN, the 1992 Framework Convention on Climate Change being a uh, treaty with force of law, once a country ratifies a treaty, they become a party to the treaty. This may be, I'm sorry for covering stuff you probably all know, but when you're a party to the treaty, the treaty doesn't just sit on a shelf. Any treaty, biodiversity treaty, Montreal Protocol on Ozone, which, by the way, was Canadian leadership to save the ozone layer in 1987. But the, the treaty is a living document. It's kind of a parliament. And every year, under every treaty, the parties to the convention gather, parties being nation states. So the conference of the parties is the COP, right? So Kyoto the, uh, hosted COP3. Kyoto, Japan was where COP3 happened, and that's where they negotiated the Kyoto Protocol. COP15 in Copenhagen was supposed to be where we negotiated the next phase. It was a disaster. But one of the things that happened in Copenhagen was that the industrialized countries kind of met in the back room and said, two degrees is fine. Two degrees looks safe. So we're going to design a non-binding, can you believe they came up with the language, politically binding, a politically binding treaty which will aim towards two degrees Celsius as a safe landing zone for humanity. And the science was already pretty clear that two degrees was very dangerous. And at two degrees global average temperature increase, and I'll just back up and give you a little factoid for science for a frame of reference for this, global average temperature is a very different thing than the weather forecast, right? So in Saskatchewan, I'm sure you get some 30 plus summer days and some minus 30 winter days. So 1.5 degrees may sound um, trivial. But the difference in global average temperature is a different thing. So the difference in global average temperature between right now on planet Earth and 10,000 years ago when Canada was under several kilometers of ice, the difference was five degrees Celsius. So one degree is huge. We're already at one degree Celsius global average temperature increase over what it was before the Industrial Revolution. So the debate in Copenhagen was, is two degrees safe? Well, the science was clear that at two degrees Celsius, all the low-lying island states would be underwater. So the delegates from Fiji, Mauritius, Maldives, kind of angry that, that the industrialized world thought two degrees was okay. Oh, yeah, we can move inland. They're underwater, yeah. 
It also was very clear that two degrees Celsius would lose too much of the Arctic, too much Arctic ice to be sure that we'd actually sustain ice on the North Pole year round, which is also essential. The ice mass on the North Pole is one of the reasons that global average temperature and the climate systems have been stable. You want to know why it got so cold in so many parts of the world this winter? Because the polar vortex is collapsing because of warmer air moving into the Arctic, pushing polar air down. But what it also is because it's driven by warmer water in the Arctic and melting ice. So going back to Copenhagen and the disastrous negotiations there, and suddenly as governments, Barack Obama, <coughs> Stephen Harper, and by the way, the Prime Minister of Denmark at the time, Prime Minister Rasmussen, I hold primarily responsible for this train wreck, but they, he had a lot of colluding help. Suddenly, all the delegates from every low-lying island state and every delegate from the continent of Africa stood up and walked out. And as they walked out, I've never seen anything so dramatic. UN negotiations are generally, if anyone's ever participated, it's a lot like watching paint dry. You don't expect anything exciting to happen. And suddenly every delegate from Africa, every delegate from a low-lying island state stood up, walked out, chanting, 1.5 to stay alive. Everyone, a unison, walking out of the convention. And they were joined by all the youth, every young person from Canada, every young person from the United States, and that's when I saw this old north-south divide that had caused us so much problem in international negotiations. It's why the first UN conference on the environment, which was in 1972 in Stockholm, Morris Strong had also been the Secretary General for that one, by the way. But in 1972 in Stockholm, most of the developing world boycotted. Because they said, pollution is an issue for you in northern countries. Doesn't affect us, we've got to get food. We've got to have a stable future. We are not wealthy enough yet to worry about pollution, so that's your issue, not ours. Indira Gandhi was the only developing country leader to attend Stockholm in 72. So it was a really big deal that the Earth Summit in 1992 was hosted by Brazil that had boycotted 1972. So there's a story here, there's a narrative of what nations do when they get together, what can be done when they're determined, and to have a train wreck like this train wreck that we saw in Copenhagen also signals something new. Developing countries are in the lead, not reluctantly looking for a north-south bargain like in Rio, not reluctantly saying, okay, we'll do something about pollution, but first we need to see some larger transfers for development assistance. We've allowed the climate crisis to get so much worse when we signed the 1992 convention that by 2009 in Copenhagen, it's the developing countries who are saying, our very existence depends on going off fossil fuels. And you want to buy us off? Because that's what Hillary Clinton, the Secretary of State in Copenhagen, and then followed by Barack Obama's president, put on the table, basically, we're not going to reduce pollution so much in the United States, but by 2020, there'll be a global climate fund with $100 billion a year for developing countries. Yeah. And as the delegate for Tuvalu said that day, we don't want your 20 pieces of silver. Our children's future is not for sale. So now we have a very different alignment. We have the poorest of the poor nations working with the world's youth because nobody else seems to be paying attention that we're in a climate emergency. And we are in a climate emergency. We are in a situation where the strongest voice on the planet right now for climate action is not any elected official from any country around the world. The strongest voice for climate action is a 16-year-old girl named Greta Thunberg from Stockholm who is leading the student strike movement. There will be a student strike event here in Regina because it's a global event this Friday, March 15th. And I make sure I give you the details. I'm sure that there's also one in Saskatoon, by the way. But it's March 15th from 10 to 11 at the Saskatchewan Legislative Building, Regina School Climate Strike. There are hundreds of thousands of children marching to say one thing really clearly. We don't want to hear you talk about transition. We don't want to hear you talk about everything will be great because the environment, the economy go hand in hand and we're making incremental changes that are so much better than if you elected the other people. What they want to hear is that someone understands 
that what the IPCC is now telling us, which is in the report of October 8, 2018, because even when we negotiated in Paris in 2015 and put together the Paris Agreement, which through a number of really good political miracles and good chairing by the French government, particularly the president of that COP, COP21, Laurent Fabius, former president of France. You know what, if you looked up Laurent Fabius before COP21, he would have been more known for being the person who was the fall guy for the government of France blowing up the Greenpeace vessel in Auckland. Thank goodness he lived long enough and was skillful enough and a dedicated, decent chair of a convention who drove the world to a 1.5 degree goal for the Paris Accord. But it's still largely unenforceable. It depends on governments stepping up and doing their part. And the IPCC report of 2018, which was requested by the Paris negotiations, what's the difference between 1.5 and 2 degrees Celsius? Well, it is now settled science that 2 degrees Celsius is beyond dangerous. Two degrees Celsius puts us on a path for irreversible, unstoppable, self-accelerating global warming from the impact of positive feedback loops. 1.5 is survivable. And the really great news is we still have the opportunity as a, civil, as a species, as a collection of governments, multilaterally, our species has the ability to hold to 1.5 degrees. It is doable, but it's not easy. It will require quite Herculean efforts. It will require massive efforts to go off fossil fuels as rapidly as possible, and certainly zero fossil fuel use by 2050, and roughly half as much as now by 2030. Now that's that's a goal. All right. But when John F. Kennedy said he was going to put a man on the moon, he had no idea how they were going to do it. On this issue, we actually have tons of ideas for how we have to do it. The IPC also said, the IPCC said, we don't need any new inventions. We're not lacking for technology. We don't lack the science. We absolutely know what we need to do to hold to 1.5 degrees Celsius global average temperature increase to keep every low lying island state above the water line to ensure that there's Arctic ice year round, well even at 1.5 degrees Celsius, we're gonna have one day a year with no Arctic ice. But to keep it there mostly, to revert and to stop the rapid acidification of our oceans, to keep ocean life alive. All of these things we can do, but the IPCC did say the one thing we are missing is political leadership and political will, which also could just be described as honesty and courage. So honesty and courage are in very short supply. And in Canada, the least honest, the most ignorant, leading, for, leading the charge to the next election is Andrew Scheer because he doesn't understand climate science at all. But the liberals in government have left in place Stephen Harper's goal, uh, which is wholly inadequate to meet even the, uh, well, it's certainly inadequate and incompatible with any two degrees. And the plans that are in place to hit Harper's target, uh, at this point, don't reach the Harper target. So Canada, for all our talk of global leadership, is at the back of the pack. I know, in terms of intention and understanding of the science, that Justin Trudeau, as a person, as an individual, understands climate science, and Andrew Scheer does not. But the net effect of both parties' sets of policies is the same runaway global warming and abandoning our children. So that's why 1.5 to stay alive has resonated with me. It hit me when the report came out October 8th, 2018, from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. How prescient were those delegates from Africa and the low Long Island states. 1.5 to stay alive is not just a slogan and not just a chant as you walk out of a room. It's a scientific reality, and we all have to deal with it in ways that reflect honesty and courage, because we know we can avoid going above it. We know we can do it in ways that create a prosperous Canada, and everybody has a job, and it's much more positive, and the quality of life goes up. 
but we still debate carbon taxes as if that's the issue. And it's not even coming close to addressing the problem. So I'm going to stop there to make sure, as I promised Cheryl, I want to make sure I have full 20 minutes of time for conversation that Cheryl will moderate. I, I, feel free to challenge me on anything. There is no dumb question here. If you don't know what I was talking about, about any aspect of the science or the policy, don't hesitate, because this is not a time to hold back. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. May. Not only did you give us a lot of information about a vitally important issue and emergency, but you did in such a way while while I was frightened, I was also inspired to do something about it. And I I understand it in such a way I can communicate it to others and hope that they will help do something about it too. That's the big goal and it's really hard to do and I'm never sure if I'm doing it right. So thank you, that means a lot to me. <laughs> Uh, Ms. May talked about the need to have courage and loud voices. Who will have a loud voice and, and courage in this room to ask a question? Jordan? I just have a question around... You're getting the mic, Karen. Oh, okay. I just have a question around the idea about... Um, you talked about before how uh, with climate change, the next, like with the degree change and everything like that, and these implications are very clearly like that. I feel that personally a lot of it is about the messaging behind how climate change is being communicated to people. Like for example, my parents have always said, well, it's not going to be a problem for 100 years, I'll be dead. And I've heard this a lot, but that's not really the case. But do you think that maybe the framing of how climate change urgency needs to be communicated to the public should be different? Yes. Well, I have to say, Jordan, let me stop by saying how very important it is that Canada uh, indigenize. Right? We're talking about reconciliation, indigenous people. If we really understood indigenous culture and ethics and learnings, we would be doing what the uh, uh, Iroquois Confederacy did and making decisions for the seven generations. And we wouldn't say, well, it's okay because I'll be dead before it hits. You know, I mean, no offense to your parents, but, um, you know. Uh, so, um, yeah, a lot of the issue is that no one understands how desperately serious it is because nobody in politics wants to say the human race could go extinct and the decisions we'd make in the next five years or whether we do or not. Because that's a really tough message. And they're afraid, I don't know why they're so afraid. I think Canadians are uh, brave, practical, sensible, and ethical as a population and compassionate. I think we're a really good, great society to motivate to do the right thing. But, you know, the, the, the weirdness of the messaging has always been, which is strange because I mentioned the issues I worked on years ago, like acid rain. I also worked on getting lead out of gasoline. And in those days, no one said, you know, lead in gasoline is compromising the intellectual capacities of many populations of low-income children. What are you willing to do about it? Are you going to drive less with your car that uses lead and gasoline? What's your responsibility to take that on? I mean, governments banned lead and gas. We didn't ask individuals, what are you prepared to do? No. Right? So in this issue as well, it's the job of governments to say, this is what we have to do. This is an existential threat. Uh, and I think communication around this has been poor. Uh, there is a sense that it's never coming as a threat. I've had friends over the years describe it as a slow motion tsunami. But it still is one that requires, and we are now at the point, which I didn't think we'd ever get to. I mean, I have to say, when I started working on this issue in 1986 in Environment Canada, we were busy solving acid rain, getting a treaty in place to save the ozone layer, banning leaded gas. I didn't think this issue would be any harder. I figured, right, we, 1992, all the countries of the earth have agreed that burning fossil fuels is a threat to our survival and that we have to adapt as quickly as possible to those levels we can no longer avoid. And we have to reduce greenhouse gases as quickly as possible. And I never thought, if I'd known, I don't know if I, I know if I would, would have had my daughter if I'd known, that this is where we'd be in 2019, if she was born in 1991. And I can't quite believe that in 2019, we're at the point where through procrastination and political cowardice, we are actually looking at a situation where if we don't change policies within the next two or three years, it gets too late to talk about survival. So, yeah, we haven't talked about it clearly. I agree with you, Jordan. I don't know how to talk about it clearly 
We'll have people saying, well, the Greens are running a fear-based campaign. You know, <laughs> well, you know, it's what Katja Tonberg says, for the girl from, the young woman from Sweden. She says, you know, she said in one of her speeches at Davos, she said, I don't want at this point, she said, usually at this point, adults want to tell us and hear about hope. I don't want to know you're hopeful. I want you to panic the way I'm panicking because our house is on fire. And then you can act. And then we can be hopeful. So it's, it's, um, it's a really tough communications challenge. Any ideas are welcome. Any ideas or another question from Regina before we go to Saskatoon? And it doesn't have to be on climate change if you have anything else on your mind, just so you know, wide open. Michelle? Carbon capture and storage is one of the most expensive ways and least effective ways to reduce greenhouse gases. Um, it, I, I, it kind of falls into the category of having your cake and eating it too. Now there's no question if you have effective carbon capture and storage requires very site specific conditions. That you have a coal fired power plant or another facility producing greenhouse gases and that you can effectively sequester the carbon so it never leaks out. Because pure carbon dioxide, like while we talk about carbon, we all excel carbon dioxide, but it's at the level of parts per million. It's a vanishingly small quantity of every breath we take. I mean, it's larger than it used to be. It's 400 parts per million. But pure carbon dioxide, of course, is heavier than air and absolutely poisonous and also has no, uh, it's invisible and there's no odor. So I used to talk to one of the early um, technological geniuses working on carbon capture and storage and he used to say, well, my nightmare is the first time that sequestered carbon leaks and it's in a hollow where a whole Boy Scout troop has camped out for the night, you know? So that's a, that's a minor issue if carbon capture and storage actually was gonna work well, but it's highly dependent on local geology. It's very expensive. And what's happened now, which changes the conversation, is that since we started working on this issue in the 80s, and actually even since the beginning of this century, we've had a, a revolution in the price of renewable versus the price of coal. So if you're building a new facility today uh, the, on the basis of lifetime costs, a solar facility is cheaper than coal. So we should be doing, especially in a province like this where there is abundant solar, we should be doing solar at, at the level of every single building on this campus should be generating its own energy. Every single building on this campus should be insulated to such an extent that even the um, various gizmos over there that are buzzing will be enough to heat a room between the, uh, the, the photocopiers and the copy makers in a building can actually heat the inside of a building if the electricity for the building is coming from solar and it's properly insulated. We need to reconceptualize our idea of what we need energy for and how fast we need it, where we can get it. So in the scheme of things, I think we've moved past carbon capture and storage because there are cheaper, uh, more viable, less risk alternatives at lower cost that are available to us. But it means going off coal. We have to go off coal as rapidly as possible globally. And I know Saskatchewan's goal is to be half renewable by 2030, which is you know better than some other provinces, but it's not enough. We talked about innovative ideas at lunch, and that was the most innovative idea I've heard for uh, capturing and uh, capturing energy and reusing it that I've heard in a long time. Thanks. Saskatoon, I'll take two questions from your room. Who would like to start? Mark Andre? Thank you. Thank you, Ms. May. That was a great, great talk. Um, I'm wondering if you could speak to the uh, U.S. Uh, proposal around the Green New Deal and how you feel about that. Is that something that you see as a hopeful, not to, not to use that word, but... Uh, yeah, well, hopeful is a good word. Thanks, Mark Andre. I think if I want to look at Mark Andre, I still look here. Is that yeah. okay? Okay, I don't want to turn my back to you, so there you are. Okay, um, it's funny about the Green New Deal. It's a challenge for us Greens in Canada because we've got more in our policies than they are offering. But when you think about it, I, well, number one, it's very exciting to have any voice in the U.S. political spectrum talking sense about climate, but also social justice. I don't know how many of you know that the Green New Deal includes the revolutionary concept of universal health care. Whoa. 
So, you know, we're so far ahead of a lot of the elements of Green New Deal and our policies, which you can find, by the way, the Green Party website has a very long document. I apologize for length, but it's about 150 pages long. It's called Vision Green, and it covers uh, basically our Green New Deal, and it's it's detailed. And, and but, you know, I find it very exciting that anyone in the U.S., given, given I mean, I... Uh, Bill Clinton is an old friend of mine, but there's no, no doubt that looking back on his administration, the, the goals and the ideals of a Democratic Party that was essentially different from Republicans in terms of the acceptance of neoliberalism and corporate rule, uh, there was a, they basically moved very much into a middle ground, and the Democratic Party's historical role as something slightly left got abandoned. And then the right went so far right, no one could even recognize it as um, within the spectrum of, um, well, I don't know, um, sanity. But anyway, um, yeah, I think it's an exciting development for the US. The challenge for Greens in Canada is I'm pretty sure any minute now, Jagmeet Singh is gonna jump up and say, the NDP is ready with Canada's Green New Deal. Well, we're still debating among ourselves as Greens well, do we want to look like we're aping something from the U.S. that isn't as good as what our work has always been under Vision Green? It's, it's, it's that kind of challenge for us, but it's definitely good news. Is there a follow-up or another question from Saskatoon? Do I see a hand in the corner? By the way, I'll just throw it into the discussion that even under Donald Trump, the U.S. is still reducing greenhouse gases faster than Canada because of action at the state level. California's economy is bigger than that of all of Canada. California, New York, many states are moving and continuing to move towards uh, the, the, the goals that, of the Paris Agreement. Uh, California is the seventh biggest economy in the world. Yeah. I saw a question from the corner. Yeah, Michaela here. Um, so I just recently read an article that was pretty good, covered both uh, media coverage of nuclear energy as well as media coverage of climate change and kind of compared them. Uh, one of the things that it talks about is the journalistic notions of good stories and balanced coverage. Um, do you have a, a vision of how you would like science to be communicated through media in the future? Because this idea of balanced coverage um, isn't really compatible with science all the time. Um, like, you kind of made a case for that at the beginning of your talk. Yeah. Just uh, any points on that? Yes, yeah, thanks, Michaela. I mean, I think I pick up on the issue of vaccinations. I mean, we have people who are prepared not to vaccinate their children and think it's based on science. So one of the problems we have, just to jump uh, to another area of concern I have going into an election, is how many people get their news off the internet and believe that if they see it on the internet and it looks authoritative, that that's something they can rely on. In the con and our news media, the CBC is in the same camp with um, Saskatoon Star Phoenix or Globe and Mail in still having problems understanding that there isn't a, a debate on the science on climate change. You don't have two sides. It took a while on the smoking issue, for example. By the way, the, the Carbon Club that I mentioned that formed deliberately, and this isn't theorizing on my part, or you know, this is actually proven by released memos. The Fossil fuel lobby hired the same people who developed the strategy for the cigarette companies for what to do when the US Surgeon General said smoking cigarettes can cause lung cancer. Well, they said we have to show that there's a debate. We have to show that there are two sides. So it was a deliberate public relations ploy and the media played into it just as they did on smoking for the longest time. There was a debate on whether smoking caused lung cancer after the U.S. Surgeon General said it did. And so we're in the same kind of situation now with climate change. I think we're at the tipping point in terms of media coverage that they're beginning to recognize you can't deny this anymore. On the other hand, I, I, I do kind of have a, kind of those who are close to me know it's sort of a, a, an emotional outburst that is uh, voluble. Every time something like the CBC in covering a climate crisis event says, Mother Nature threw us a curveball. Mother Nature's getting annoyed with you. Really annoyed. Because this is humanity's industrial revolution biting us and hurting us, and it's not a natural event anymore. This is outside the range of normal climate variability. This is under the IPCC 98 degree confidence. 
we should stop talking about Mother Nature threw us a curveball. We need to say these are climate events. This is climate crisis We're in a climate emergency. And we need to act. So yeah, the media coverage has been a big par part of the problem. Um, science is challenging for reporters. And I'll also say in, deferent, in defense of the news media that the capacity of our journalistic outlets to adequately cover tough issues has been remarkably eroded since 1992. At the Earth Summit in 92, or the, the first global scientific conference on climate change with a public face was hosted in Toronto in the last week of June, 1988. I helped organize it. At that time, we had a full-time Globe and Mail specialist um, named uh, Michael Keating. You could give Michael Keating volumes on any subject to read it, he would read it. He could explain science to people because he understood it. The Toronto Star had a reporter named David Israelson. He wasn't quite as ready to take volumes, but he definitely read and understood what you were talking about because he would read up and understand it, and he was a full-time reporter on environment. The CBC had a reporter named Eve Savory. I don't know how many people watching or listening now, Doug remembers. Eve Savory knew climate science. If you were to catch her in a corridor and say, there's some new evidence about what happens if we should go above 1.5 degrees Celsius, there's some positive feedback loops that affect the albedo effect, she would understand in an instant what you were talking about. We have no single reporter for CBC anymore because Marco McDermott just retired. We have no one in the Globe and Mail who covers climate science full time. We have, you know, et cetera. So they are also, they fall into just trying to survive in newsrooms with far fewer reporters and with the challenges of a 24-hour news cycle. In the challenge of a 24-hour news cycle, you'd much rather cover the latest expose on Michael Jackson than climate science, because you know how to cover it, and it doesn't stretch your bandwidth, it doesn't keep you late at the office, it isn't something you can't do. So our news media has moved far more towards tabloid coverage, because you can do it, and it's easy. And the public level of scientific literacy has suffered as a result. Can you take a couple more? Yes. Another question from Regina. Hi, uh, Larissa. Hi, Elizabeth. <laughs> so my question actually relates also to what you were speaking about, but um, has to do with the SNC-Lavalin scandal. And I'm wondering if you have advice or can, um, can provide some insight into how voters are to navigate this upcoming election with that scandal and the issue of climate change. Um, because what I see with the news media is um, they provide a lot of coverage about the SNC-Lavalin scandal, but at the same time, news on climate change is, is still very much lacking, as yeah. you just explained. Thanks, Larissa. And of course, Larissa is someone I've known forever because she used to be on the uh, Federal Council of the Green Party of Canada, so it's really good to see you again. Look, um, there's some things the SNC-Lavalin scandal and climate change have in common, which is that it shines a light on a prime ministerial office, and I'll have to say, full disclosure, I love all those individuals. Justin Trudeau, Jerry Butts, Katie Telford, fantastic human beings, lovely people. So what the heck is going on? Even though they got elected with a promise of evidence-based decision-making on both the Kinder Morgan pipeline and on SNC-Lavalin, the issue of jobs is used as a reason for decision-making with zero evidence collected. So on the case of the Kinder Market Pipeline, the hearings before the National Energy Board, it, um, I, I was an intervener, so just to give you a brief example, the, uh, when in 2014, one of the interveners, so this is a legal quasi-judicial process under the National Energy Board, was Unifor, the largest union in Northern Alberta. And their evidence was rejected by the National Energy Board. Because the National Energy Board said on the list of issues they were to pursue, Jobs and the economy were not on the issues for them to study. Fascinating then that the NEB can now say, well, yes, it will probably have a significant dangerous effect on the killer whales. Yes, it will have a significant increase to greenhouse gases. Yes, it will violate indigenous uh, treaty rights to use this. So on the, yes, all these things, huge environmental damage. But it's offset by all the benefits to jobs and the economy, which I know the National Energy Board never looked at because they excluded it from analysis 
and they rejected Unifor's evidence. By the way, Unifor's evidence was that building the Kinder Morgan pipeline would cost Canada jobs, good union jobs in refineries, and therefore the largest union in northern Alberta was against pursuing the Kinder Morgan pipeline. So back to SNC Lavalin. I hope, because your question is how do voters navigate? Again, this is the kind of scandal that media like because it is easier to track. Unlike Michael Jackson's new documentary, this is actually an important question for Canadian voters because we need to know if our institutions work well, if the constitutional principle of prosecutorial independence, which is a bulwark of the rule of law that politicians can't get involved and say, go easy on that guy, he's my friend. We don't like that. that that's kind of corrupt crony capitalism, so what do you do? I'm hoping by the time we go to the polls that either through an inquiry or through uh, Justin Trudeau finally doing the right thing, which would be to say, gee, we should never have been pressuring Jody Wilson-Raybould. I'm ashamed to say that as Prime Minister, I didn't know that was wrong because the legal advice I was getting was wrong. And we're going to replace our legal advisors. We're going to get rid of the clerk of Privy Council who was willing to lean on the Attorney General. Whether because Trudeau asked him to, I don't know. No one knows why Michael Wernick phoned Jody Wilson-Raybould at home and for an hour and a half tried to, essentially, using veiled threats, but the veil was pretty thin, threaten her into giving a deferred prosecution agreement to snc Lavalin. No one knows why that happened, but clearly for those of you in schools of public policy, this will go down, I think, in the books as what a clerk of Privy Council doesn't do. The, the, the clerk of Privy Council should have made sure Justin Trudeau got good legal advice. He didn't. The clerk of Privy Council was prepared to support bad legal advice that you can continue to pressure the Attorney General to take into account irrelevant considerations with no evidence, like jobs. So I hope that by the time we get to the election, this issue has been put to bed and a light has been shown on the question of what does it look like to respect the rule of law and how deeply do the tentacles of a company that is already ruled as so corrupt that the World Bank won't do business with them. So I'm not jumping the gun on we have a presumption of innocence even for a corporation of course uh, on the corruption and bribery charges you know what they're accused of doing I mean, the bribery was bribing um, the uh, um, Muammar Gaddafi and his son in order to get a contract to build a prison inside Libya with the US so this is not good works in Libya what one might say given the, the regime of Muammar Gaddafi and the bribes included providing prostitutes to Muammar Gaddafi's son and it was not money that spilled off the end of the table. This is tens of millions of dollars. And how is it that Deloitte's has been the auditor for SNC Lavalin for all its history? If you were a corporation that discovered that tens of millions of dollars had disappeared in bribes, you might want to fire your auditor. But Deloitte's is still their auditor. There's something very, this needs a full trial. We need to get the light of day on this to figure out what's going on that one of Canada's, as Justin Trudeau once referred to it, un fleuron de Canada, a wonderful flower of Canada, SNC Lavalin. I, uh, by the way, the other thing about jobs, I'll share with you this great idea that I'm advancing, which is that if it turns out SNC Lavalin is guilty, what does the penalty look like that fits the crime? So we want to invent something new, corporate community service wherein with the SNC Lavalin will have to work, will do all of its contracts inside Canada. By the way, they're building a coal plant in Colombia. As a penalty, I think they should stop that. But meanwhile, we could say SNC Lavalin will do all its work in Canada, all its workers get paid, the contract will reflect all the cost of materials, but we'll be eliminating any profit for shareholders for a 10 year period. Or we could be nice and make it five years. But SNC Lavalin workers could be, because they're engineers, Let's engineer clean drinking water on every reserve in Canada. Let's build some improvements to the east-west electricity grids so that we can get renewable energy from one side of the country to the other easily and cheaply. And the people of Canada will benefit from contracts that no longer include a profit margin for the company doing the engineering work. Community service. And uh, maybe some of the people who want to keep this issue from going to trial will find out who they are and why large corporate players in Canada who've been in and out of SNC Lavalin's board, maybe pulling strings with all the people they ever knew to try to keep their name clear from complicity in bribing Libyan officials. I bet my time's up now. <laughs>
for our students, I'd like to say that those are the innovative ideas that if you included in your briefing notes, whether for courses here or for your managers in the public service, they would get attention. Thanks, Cheryl. Unfortunately, our time has come to a close because we have classes starting. But I want to close by saying that in listening to the dialogue and, and Ms. May's presentation, I came to understand why not only has she achieved the awards that I enumerated in introducing her, but why she was also named by her colleagues in Parliament as the hardest working, most collegial, and smartest colleague that they have. <laughs> Thank you. It's really nice when your colleagues give you an award like that. I'm working on this congeniality. That'll be my, <laughs> my ultimate accolade. <laughs> so please join me in thanking her for the time that she's had. And where I started, a privilege and an honor to stand in the place of my friends Al Johnson and Tommy Shayana. And God bless you, Jim. I sure miss you. Thank you.